right, so we chose to do the finding, finding the mathematics and golf. And then I'm Hunter. I'm Lucas. Why we chose golf? We chose golf to find, we chose to find the mathematics and calculus in golf with the hopes that by studying and analyzing the different aspects of the game, we would in turn improve our scores. So the history of golf, its origin was of modern day golf is traced back to the 15th century Scotland. And in 1457, the Scottish Parliament banned the game of golf because it was interfering with their archery practice and they're really big with the military at that time. But then in the 1500s, the ban on golf in Scotland was lifted. In 1729, the first reference to golf was made in the US. And in 1894, the United States Golf Association was formed. And in 1900, it was played in the Paris Olympic Games. And then it was stopped playing, stopped playing in the Olympic Games in 1904. And then it, it, it's going to return this year at the Rendition of the Olympics for the first time in 112 years. And in 1916, the PDA of America was formed, which is the Professional Golfers Association. And then in 1950, the Ladies Professional Golfers Association was formed in the US. And then the evolution of golf clubs. So in the 1500s, most of the players used wooden clubs, even though iron was more accurate, but it was, more, it was harder to get at the time. And then they were made of like woods like apple and beech and pear, which are harder woods. And in the 1800s, the fact the industrialization allowed uh, the mass production of iron clubs in Europe. And then from 1900s to the present, uh, grooves were added to the club faces to allow for more spin on the ball. And steel shafts were introduced as well as, well as graphite shafts and titanium heads. And these are just like the names of the earlier clubs uh, the, for the driver. Or nowadays driver is what's called the long nose, and then the fairway woods were called boulders, and then irons were called fairway clubs, and like your wedges and short range clubs were called spoons and niblicks, and then your putter was called a cleek. And these are just those are just the pictures of the older clubs, and these are just an example of the newer clubs today. This would be the long nose. So the club and striking the ball, uh, this is just a chart of the different types of clubs and the different loft angles of the clubs right here and then the distance that correspond with those angles. So then this is shows like as the loft angle of the club increases, the distance that the ball travels decreases, so it's a negative correlation. And then using a line of best fit, you can approximate the linear equation for the graph data. And then using the endpoints as the, to find the slope, the secant slope technically, because it's not perfectly linear. Um, you can find this by doing y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. And the slope approximately equals a negative 2.48. And then this equation, you can plug in an x for which is any loft angle. And then it will result in an approximation for the distance that the ball will travel in the So a short range of play. Uh, getting a hole in one is one of those things that rarely happen in golf. Uh, but just how hard is it to get a hole in one? So the smallest PGA par three length to pin is 121 yards. And the average PGA green size is 3,500 yards squared. So if you take the hole and you find the area of it, you can integrate the absolute value of positive or negative 2.125 squared minus x squared the half power, you get 14.186 inches squared. So, assuming that the golfer hits the ball 121 yards and hits the green, the hole accounts for 0.01% of the area of the green. So to actually get the ball to either roll or fall right in the hole is very difficult, and your chances are slim to none. So that really just shows how hard it is to actually get a hole in one. Um, collisions and impact like the club and the ball. So I just have an example for is this. Uh, the mass of the golf ball is actually 0.04593 kilograms. And then an example of the mass of a driver club head is 0.17 kilograms. And we researched at the optimal velocity to swing the club or to swing your club at before collision is 49.17 meters per second. 
and momentum is measured in mass times velocity. And at the point of impact, technically this is an elastic collision because they travel at different velocities after impact. But at the point of impact, the speeds are so high that like they compress together. So I'm just using it as an example that's an inelastic collision at the point of impact. So then to find this, you just take the velocity of the, or the momentum of the club and the momentum of the ball set it instead equal to the momentum of the club and the, plus the momentum of the ball after collision. And this results at the point of impact, the speed changes of before the collision, the club head was traveling 49.17 meters per second. And then at the point of collision, the traveling combined speed at 38.7 meters per second. So this would be the instantaneous rate of the ball being in the team. Um, and here we have the mathematics focusing on the golf swing itself. Um, a model that represents the golf swing, but it's not perfect, is a double pendulum. Um, and a double pendulum is something that produces something called chaotic motion, just meaning it has no regular pattern. Um, so here what I did is I just used this physics formula to find potential energy, and then mass times gravity times height. And I just made height the, um, the location or the, like the distance graph of the one of these masses. So this y1 would be the y coordinate for this that first mass right here. So this is mass one and mass two. And this double pendulum represents, so this would be like your shoulder, or this would be like your, sh your arm and your shoulder. And then when you're swinging, the uh, second pendulum would come in with your wrist. And this basically is the closest thing we can get to representing the golf swing. And what I did was I put this formula, the mass times mass times gravity times height, in terms of this double pendulum model, and it gives you this formula for potential energy. And then what you can do is you can find the kinetic energy produced by the golf swing, or like what technically should be produced. And so a basic formula for calculating kinetic energy is one half mass times velocity squared. And when you put that again in terms of this double pendulum model, so this is the norm, this is the first normal, and this is the second normal to give you those angles of at which the pendulum is swinging. And um, yeah, and you can see here it's not just one of them. You have it takes both of them into consideration because you have the this is technically mass one and mass two or the just mass one and you have the x and y respects and that's here again too and then when you differentiate you get this and I'll show you how that's done on the next slide so from that double pendulum model this gives you the position of the mass one um, in respects to like its x position, and that's right here. And then this is the position of mass at two, and then in the y position and the second y position for the second mass at. And then when you differentiate those, that's what it gives you. So what I did was I went to Avocado and I took calculations on when golfers were at the course and when, you know, what times they came out, how many golfers there were on the course. And what I did was I created a function that represented this, um, the amount of golfers on the course at one time. So the number of golfers on a certain golf course at time t is represented by the function g of x equals 30 times the sine of 0.75 t plus 30 for 0 to 14. 0 being 7 a.m. and 14 being 9 p.m. Using this, we can make a few different calculations. Say you wanted to go to this course when it's at least busy. To do this, you would find the relative minimums. So you would take the derivative of g sub t, and you would set it equal to 0. And you would get 
2.16, 0.3, and 10.5, but you also have to consider that zero is a critical number also, so that could be a relative minimum since it is included in this interval. So the only rel relative minimum on that interval is 6.3, so that's when the course would be least busy, is 6.3 hours after 7 a.m., which is around 6.15. So if you wanted to go on the course and golf, when there are no other golfers on the course, it would be 1.15. This is a graph showing that. So you have here, this is 7 a.m. Starts out with the men's quota group. There's about 30 of them that tee off right at 7 a.m. And from there, it increases. And right around 1.15 here, there are no golfers on the course. And then this is the derivative of that, showing that that is where that critical number occurs. And then you could also estimate how many total golf golfers there were on the course in one day using that function. So you could use a Riemann sum. And I chose to use a midpoint Riemann sum because that they are normally the most accurate when doing a Riemann sum. Um, so you take dx times f of 1 and f of 2 plus f of 3 and so on, and you get 466 golfers. So these are the squares that I used. So you can see that it goes above this function and it has below the function. So it does, it is pretty, it is uh, relatively inaccurate. But Using this other method, you can integrate. You can integrate from 0 to 14 of g of x, and you get 479 total golfers. <coughs> All right, um, the next slide, is, this is on creating s spin on the golf ball. So the spin loft of, uh, of, an, of a hit, I guess you call it. Collision, I guess, is measured by taking the dynamic loft of the club, which is how steep or like how flat it is, and then subtracting the attack angle from that. So this tells you that the and the attack angle in this picture it's like it's right here because this is my back swing right here, and then this is the attack angle that I came down on. So the larger that the spin loft angle is, the greater the RPM that the ball has. But in return, this with the increase in the spin, uh, there's a loss in distance traveled that occurs. And right here, this you can see that there's a larger different or a larger spin loft angle here, but the distance that it carries is only 191. And then there's a smaller spin loft angle here, but this travels 214 points. And uh, just to clarify, we used this program called Tracker that was given to us earlier this year in college physics, and. Basically, we just used a multitude of point masses that allowed us to track his swing as he went through. And so basically, here is the history of calculus itself. Um, so there's two big mathematicians that come into mind, and that would be Sir Isaac Newton and Gottfried Leibniz. Um, they kind of competed for who really discovered calculus, and I guess in the end they both kind of won. I guess they tied. Um, Isaac Newton developed his ideas on his own, and he published a book, I can't remember what it's called, but that focused on the more real um, geometrical aspects of calculus and a lot of proofs using um, things called There you go. Where Gottfried Leibniz focused more on the um, the notation of calculus and how to put it out on in book, essentially, and they essentially laid the foundation for calculus, and a lot of other mathematicians uh, contributed to the whole picture of 
now what we have modern calculus today. And for example, the approximation under the curve for the Ryman sum was named after mathematician Bernard Ryman, who worked to make best contributions to the concept of the Fourier series and the idea of evaluating an integral. And we get our continuity, which is essentially how we take the derivative by a limit. And that was Augustin Kashi. Augustin Kashi did a lot to prove fundamental ideas of calculus and made contributions to complex analysis in abstract algebra. And then this is more of how history, of how math has been applied to golf throughout history. Um, basically, as the game's gotten on, technology has gotten better, and people try to analyze the game more. And they saw that if you would decrease the the mass of the driver heads, but still somehow make them equally as strong using better metals such as titanium, um, the golf the golf players will be able to hit the ball farther and with more backspin given by the grooves. And that backspin is what's going to create that uh, turbulence from the boundary layer of air that hits it. And also, um, I believe in 1905, dimples were added to the ball. And these dimples just allow the ball to catch more air to give it more of that backspin. And this is seen to double the distance of a drive compared to when it's hit with a smooth, smooth ball. And finally, other applications of the mathematics. So the mean value theorem, which is similar to the, my first slide that I shared, and it can be applied finding the instantaneous velocity of, at a seat value of a car over an interval of time. So then my cops could use it, apply MBT to determine whether or not a car is speeding by taking a certain time in the speed and then another certain time in the speed and then finding the energy of that time. And then momentum can be applied to almost anything that involves motion or collisions. And the example I chose was airbags and how cars and how they're using cars to minimize the force in an accident. And then integrating functions. Uh, that produce rates can be used in many situations as well. And, and an application of this that I chose to use has been uh, similar to a lot of the practice calc AP exams that we use, uh, how when water we use and enters a water treatment plant, and then using the antiderivative to determine the total amount of water that went through the plant over a given period of time.